My name is Ian Bethune. Um, I come from Edinburgh University, specifically the, the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre, which is it's the, the UK's uh, premier high com performance computing centre. We have some very large supercomputers up in Edinburgh, and we develop software uh, for all kinds of research that goes on there. But really, what I'm going to talk about today, although I will show you some pictures of supercomputers, is, is to talk about the project Prime Break, which is an international uh, volunteer computing project for solving hard mathematical problems using volunteers' computers. And so what I hope to do today is to show you some of the problems we're tackling, how it works, and uh, hopefully convince you guys that maybe some of you might be interested in getting involved in. Okay? Um, so just to, to uh, give you a bit of expectation about the kind of things we're going to cover, so there was an article in the press um, in the last couple of weeks that said, being a geek was no longer seen as a bad thing. It might suddenly be coming cool again to be a geek. So I thought I'd introduce you to, uh, to, to three geeks to kind of cover the main topics uh, of, of this morning's talk. So this is um, Paul Erdős. So he's a, a, a stereotypical famous uh, maths geek. Um, he's actually one of the most active mathematicians in the world ever, according to the number of publications he made. Uh, he wrote over 1,500 mathematical publications. Uh, and he worked with so many people. This started this uh, idea that mathematicians would give themselves an Erdős number. So Erdős has the Erdős number zero. Anybody that's worked with Erdős or wrote a paper with him has an Erdős number of one. Anyone that's worked or wrote a paper with somebody who wrote a paper with Erdős has an Erdős number of two. And so you could build up this network of how connected people were to Paul Erdős. You may have seen something similar in the, 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 the field of, uh, of Hollywood. And there's also the, the Kevin Bacon number, which is exactly the same thing uh, for, for, for people who co-starred with Kevin Bacon in, in, in films. So there'll be a certain amount of maths geekery in the talk. And if you relate to this, I hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, so my second geek is Steve Wozniak. So he's the, the other Steve, not Steve Jobs, who co-founded Apple Computer uh, and basically designed uh, by himself, more or less, uh, the hardware for the first two products that Apple Computer shipped. Okay? And, uh, you may have seen him. Uh, he went on uh, Dancing with the Stars, which is kind of the, the US equivalent of Strictly Come Dancing. Uh, so he's our hardware geek, and we'll have a little bit of hardware geekery going on in this talk. Um, and then here's what you may or may not have heard of, uh, our software geek, Ada Lovelace. Um, so she's such a geek that she was uh, basically uh, sent to Britain the first ever real computer program. But she was so much of a geek, she wrote a program for a computer that didn't actually exist, uh, which was the, uh, the Charles Babbage's analytical engine. So there's going to be a certain amount of software geekery going on in the talk. And if you happen to be one of these people who's actually a poly geek and falls into uh, more than one of these categories, then I hope you'll be extra happy today. So, uh, the, the, the topic really uh, of what prime grid is about, as the name suggests, about prime numbers, so a good place to start um, would be to, to, to be clear about what the definition of what a prime number is. Uh, and so, just because you don't get an easy ride on a Sunday morning, um, I'm going to ask that question to you. Anybody want to give me a hazard of definition of a prime number? Uh, if you get a good stab at it, you get rewarded as well. So, yeah, it's very ahead. informal, but it's a number that divisible only by one and itself. That's good enough for me. Catch. <laughs> oh. oh, good work. Okay, so here's the definition taken from the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, a number, actually an integer, a whole number, um, that cannot be divided by any other whole number except for itself and one. So this is the prime number. These are the, the basic... I should have said integer. That's good. Well, it's not in the Oxford English Dictionary, so uh, no criticism there. Um, so these, these are your basic fundamental building blocks um, of, of all other numbers, the basic, basic atoms of arithmetic. Uh, and, and the idea is that really, we want to really understand these so that we understand the whole well, the whole number system that's built on top of it. Okay, so uh, let's, let's put that definition to the test. So again, question for you guys. Uh, here's a number 11. Okay. Uh, and it, ha hands up, who thinks 11 is prime? Okay, it's a pretty good majority. Everybody think 11 is not prime. It is, in fact, a prime, and of course we know it's a prime because none of the numbers smaller than 11, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, divide into 11 uh, without giving a remainder. Okay, so that's just straight from the definition uh, that, that the 11 is prime. How about, here's another one, slightly larger. 121. Anyone want to, to, to hazard a guess for that one? Non-prime. Non-prime. He's trying I to collect... one and you get two, and it's a way of multiplying by 11. Yeah. 
Okay, exactly. So 121 is 11 times 11. So it's clearly not a prime, it's divisible by 11. Uh, and what we say for numbers which are not primes, we call them composite because they're composed of other primes. And actually, the, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which as the name suggests, is a very important theorem, says that uh, every number can be decomposed into products of primes unless it's a prime itself. Okay, making work a bit harder here. 32,423. Oh. I think it's divisible by three. But I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you a sweetie for, 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 for guessing. <laughs> it is, in fact, a prime. Is it? It is. Sorry, senior brain. Yeah, it's not. No, no number smaller than, uh, than 30,423 will divide into that equally. You, you can check it. Uh, actually, I mean, you don't need to divide every possible number. All you need to do is test the, the primes up to the square roots of that number. Um, there are only 41 of those, so a bit of a bit of pen and paper you could get there, and you'd find it wasn't half the prime. Okay. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a thick one. This has got 39 digits in it. Uh, prime. Prime, good man. Was that, was that a 50 50 or prior knowledge? 50 50. How do you know? Okay, so. Oh, it's fine. So I, I kind of cheated a bit because it, I, I wrote this out longhand, all, all 39 digits of it. Um, you more commonly recognize it here as 2 to the power of 127 minus 1. So this is the whole uh, expansion of that number. Um, this is what's called a, a Mersenne prime. Uh, these, these are quite famous, and there's some very large ones that are known. In fact, the largest prime numbers in the world which are known are Mersenne primes. Uh, and this one uh, was proved by Edward Lucas in 1876. He did it by hand, okay? And we'll come on later to how do you go about proving some of these very large numbers are prime or not prime. Last one. Prime. Who said prime? The largest number the center of it. Good, someone's done their homework. Okay, so, yeah, so this was discovered at the beginning of uh, last year. Since the, the, the largest known prime, it has about 17.4 uh, million decimal digits. If you write that out, that takes about, uh, in size 10 font, something like 5,000 sheets of A4 uh, to write out. So I don't recommend you do it. Uh, maybe someone could turn it into a big one day. Okay, so, um, so far, you kind of more or less had to either guess the number was prime or not, or if it was small enough, you maybe knew what the factors of it were. You could work out from this definition, uh, you could test all the, all the possible factors of any given number and see if it's prime or not. And so that's what we call trial division, right? All you're doing is you're taking a number and trying to divide it by lots of other smaller numbers, all the primes up to its square root. And if you find that none of them divide, then lo and behold, you say that ends a prime. This is exactly the, the, the process uh, that, that has been used for many hundreds of years. Um, so, for example, one again, two to the seventeen minus one. Uh, so this is again another of these Mersenne primes uh, w w was proven in, in 1558, uh, several hundred years ago, to be a prime by this chap called uh, Cataldi. Now he actually um, also claimed that several larger, I think, uh, two to the up to two to thirty one and two to the thirty seven were also Mersenne primes, and was subsequently proven wrong. Uh, but he used trial division. Uh, and that was really the only way that anybody knew about to, to, to see whether something was prime or not. Uh, the largest uh, prime recorded using trial division was this 12-digit number uh, in the mid-1800s. These are quite hard work. You have, a large, you, you have to generate a large table of primes and then divide them into, into your candidate number. So, method for generating a uh, table of primes. Uh, many of you have seen this before. Something called the, the sieve of Eratosthenes uh, from, uh, from, from ancient Greece. Um, so this is just uh, showing how, how to generate primes up to, uh, I think, 120. So how it works, you start off with the, the first number in your list, and then mark off all the multiples of it. So in that case, okay. So we start with two, mark off all the multiples of two, and there are all your even numbers. Take the next thing you're left with is a prime, mark up all the multiples of that, multiples of three, repeat the process to five, seven, um, and I wouldn't do any further than that actually because 11 squared is greater than 120. So everything's left there, either the numbers of two, three, five, seven, or all these pink numbers that are left over are the primes. And you can, in fact, the, the, um, the number I showed before that the Katami proved, you had to generate a table of primes up to 750 in order to prove that, that, that number to be prime. So this is quite a time consuming <coughs> process. Um, and so really, for, for this, is, this is why um, up until 
in the last sort of 150 years, uh, the numbers that could be proven prime or not were limited to sort of round about the order of 40 digits, just because of the, the, the hard work you have to go through of generating all these primes to do, do trial division. Um, so that number I showed you again, the, the, the 39 digit number approved prime by Lucas. Um, how did he do that? Well, I think he didn't do it um, using trial division. Reason being, in order to do it, you need about uh, a million billion primes to trial divide, okay? And even if you're pretty handy with your arithmetic, um, that's going to take you a couple of trillion years um, to get to. And to be honest, I couldn't keep up that rate of maths for, for that long. So, my you know, very obvious conclusion is we think Lucas must have found a better method. And what was it? Um, so, it's this idea um, of Lucas sequences. Um, so, the, the actual sort of derivation of this really comes from some relatively advanced group theory, and I don't want to go into it mainly because I don't understand it very well myself, but I know how the algorithm works. Um, so, this is it. Um, this was a, a, a particular algorithm for testing these Mersenne primes that I talked about, so 2 to the power of some prime minus 1. Um, so you, you, you pick a number that you want to test, and you start off by defining a sequence starting with 4. Okay. Then you've got some certain number of steps, um, p minus 2 steps, and what you do each step is you take this number, starting with 4, you square it, and then you subtract 2. And you keep doing that repeatedly. Okay. p minus 2 times, okay? Uh, you guys are going to have a shot at this in a minute, uh, so, so pay attention. Um, once you've done that, you've done p minus 2 steps, you do a check to see whether the number you've got at the end, this s, divides, uh, the, whether the, the, the primary you start with divides the, the number you get at the end of the sequence. And if, it, if the answer is yes, uh, they divide, then you say that this number is in fact proven to be a prime. Uh, if not, it's a composite number, it's not a prime. But interestingly, so this is much, much faster compared to doing you know, a million, million, million trial divisions. Actually, all you need to do here is a small number, relatively small number of multiplications, the squaring and the subtractions, and then one final division test at the end. Um, so this is obviously much faster than doing things by trial division. We can test in much larger numbers. But what it doesn't give you, if you, it just gives you a yes or no answer as to whether your number is prime or not. It doesn't tell you if it's not prime what its factors are. That's a quite an important distinction, actually. Once you get these much larger numbers, we can say with certainty whether they're prime or not. If they're not prime, we don't know what the factors are. Um, so this, uh, this algorithm was first described by, by Lucas, and he used this to, uh, to prove the primality of 2 to the 127 minus 1. Um, and it was later improved in the, uh, in the 1930s uh, to, to generate this thing called the, the Lucas-Limmer test. Okay? And this is what's used today to prove primality of all the largest known prime numbers, all these Mersenne primes. So the steps this algorithm involves square, repeatedly squaring and subtracting by two. And when you square numbers, they can get big very, very quickly. Essentially, the length of the number can double almost every time uh, that you square. And, and quickly, if you start doing this by hand, even for relatively small, uh, small primes, you can find that the numbers in the sequence quickly become very, very unwieldy, especially if you're doing this by hand really too big for us to actually to, 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 to operate on in practice. But there's a kind of uh, a little trick we can play here, and this is uh, a, a very common uh, scheme which is used throughout number theory, actually, a whole bunch of applications. What we need in the end is we only need to be able to say, we don't care actually what S is, we just care whether it's divisible um, by, by, by the prime we're trying to test. So what we do is we use a thing called clock arithmetic, or modular arithmetic. So you may have come across before, it's a very, very natural thing that we do every day if we're trying to work out where we need to be at a certain time of the day, okay? So if I ask you to do, um, I'll get my sweeties at the ready again. This is a really easy one, come on, if anyone's hungry. Um, what's uh, three plus five? Eight. Eight. Okay. Give, it, give it the young lads. Oh, there we go. Okay. Eight. So three o'clock plus five hours uh, takes you out to eight o'clock, okay? This is... It's something we all know, and that, that's true irrespective of if you did that on the clock or if you just did it using standard arithmetic. Okay, so we do 3 plus 10. Where did we get to? 1. Oh, sorry, it dropped short there. Give you another one. Get a second. Oh, you got it. Okay. Okay, so 3 plus 10 equals 1. Now, this is clearly not true um, following uh, normal arithmetic. 3 plus 10 would be 13. Um, but actually, what we, the way we write this, uh, when we're using clock arithmetic, which has 12 hours on the clock, or modular arithmetic in base 12, 
we say that 3 plus 10 is equal to 1 modulo 12. So what, we can, what you can do, you can either, you can think about doing the, the number on some, you, know, you can do modulo everything at any base, you can think about a clock that has, if you're working modulo 98, that has 98 uh, numbers around the clock, um, or equally what you can also do is you can do the sum in standard arithmetic and then get rid of any multiples of, your, of, of the number of hours of your clock. So in this case, you can do 3 plus 10 equals 13, and then you subtract out 12 until you get left with a number which is uh, between, uh, between, zero, uh, between 0 and 12. So that, that, that's how clock arithmetic works. And of course, what this does is it means that the numbers you're working with never get bigger than the number uh, that you're working uh, in that modular base. So uh, we can use this idea and when we do the, uh, the, the Lucas Labor test, if we work modulo with the prime number we're trying to test, so our, that gives us a sort of cap on how big the numbers we're ever going to have to manipulate uh, can become. So we're going to try a little experiment. Um, so again, you don't get away uh, scoffing just by sitting in the audience listening to me talk. You're going to have to do some maths. Um, so what we've got is I, I, I've put out some of these little white worksheets alongside a little calculator and a pen. Um, so I'm just going to go through a simple example. Um, so there, there's, I think, three different uh, Mersenne primes that we're going to test. What to do is just make a start on the worksheet, do a few rows, and then hand it on to one of your neighbours. There's about, I think, maybe uh, 12 of these uh, scattered around the audience. So hopefully you'll all get to have a shot. Uh, so the way it works, so this is a, the Lucas Labor test, testing whether 31 is prime. So 31 can be written as 2 to the 5 minus 1, it's a Mersenne prime. Um, so I, I've, I've given you a, a little start. So the first term of the sequence, as you said, was 4. So the way it works, what we do, we square it to get 16, and then we subtract 2 to get 14. And then to get to the next step, you then apply this, uh, this, this modular, uh, modular arithmetic or clock arithmetic. We're working here, because we're testing 31, we're working modular 31. So, in this case, 14 actually is unchanged, it's less than 31, so we go on to the next step. We square 14 to get 196, subtract 2 to 94. Now, here, 94, 194 is bigger than 31, so we have to reduce the size of the number so that it fits uh, in, in, in our modular arithmetic scheme. And the way you do that, there's a, a little um, sort of cheat sheet on your, your handout to show you how to do that in the calculator. Um, one of the easiest ways to do it, um, you can see, if you, if you divide 194 by 31, you get an answer something like 6.25 um, followed by some other decimal places. Um, so what you can do is you can subtract off 6 times 31, and what you get actually is 8. Okay? So this is, a, this is the, problem, the, the, the trickiest bit of the, the algorithm you're going to have to work through. Um, and then again, 8 squared is 64, subtract 2 is 61. And 62 modulo 31, you can probably see there that 62 can be written as 2 times 31. So actually, when we work modulo 31, we get the answer to 0. And that's equivalent of saying uh, that this S3, whatever the, if we did this without using the modulo arithmetic, whatever we came for our final value of S3 uh, is divisible by 31, and so 31 is a prime. Okay? So, have, grab, grab hold of your worksheet, make a start, and pass it along. I mean, you can do that by continue talking, and we'll come back to, um, to look at some of the results uh, later on in the talk, okay? Um, what I'm also going to do, uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to start a little program running on my laptop here. Uh, so this is a program which implements the, the Lucas Limer test for a much larger number. Okay. And so, what I kind of hope to show you by, by uh, getting to this is actually how a distributed volunteer computing project works. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at some of the problems you might come across, um, and we'll see how well you do. Okay, so, let's move on. So really, as I said before, we want to understand well how these, uh, how these prime numbers behave. This is a quote from, from Paul Ergosh, who I introduced at the beginning. It says, God may not play dice with the universe. We, you know, whether a number is prime or not is a deterministic thing. We can test it, but something very strange is going on with the prime numbers. You know, they, if you, um, you, you, you start to, to, to work at how they're distributed, there's, there's some sort of randomness appearing there. We don't understand it very well. Um, 
And so the, the, the prime number theorem um, from, from, from Gauss and Legendre, famous mathematicians from the 18th century, um, so they, they show that you, you can have this, this, this pi function which counts the number of primes less than x. And you can write out this expression which is approximately equal to the number of primes. So we say the number of primes is constantly increasing as we go uh, to larger and larger values of x, the number of primes continues to increase, but it also slows down. Um, and actually, um, so the uh, sort of corollary from this is that there clearly are an infinite number of primes. This function will just go off to infinity. Um, and they're on average further and further apart. We don't know exactly where they are, but we can make some statements about them uh, on average. So I just wanted to show you, I don't know, maybe you can't have a maths talk because I haven't got proof in it. But I, I include this uh, because I think it's kind of, it's an interesting little uh, insight into to, to how mathematical proof can work. There's a method called proof by contradiction. And the way this works is you start, like any proof, you make some assumptions, you follow logical steps from those assumptions, and in a proof by contradiction, what you do is you try and derive some inconsistency from your basic assumptions you made. And the way it works is if you find from your assumptions you follow a bomb proof cast iron set of logical steps and derive something which is inconsistent, the only thing that can be wrong was your initial uh, assumption that you made. And so therefore you can say the initial assumption was wrong. So how this works, um, <coughs> we're going to try and prove that there are an infinite number of primes, and we start by making an assumption that there are in fact a finite number of primes. If there are a finite number of primes, we can write them all down. It doesn't really matter what they are for the purpose of the argument, um, but some set of primes, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to use those primes to build ourselves a new number called capital P. We do that by multiplying all these primes together, and then a the little trick here, we add on one. Okay, so this is some new number that's constructed from these primes that we said are our complete finite set of primes. Then we can ask ourselves some questions about this new number we've constructed. We ask ourselves, okay, is that a prime number, is it not? I don't know, but um, what we can do is we can do trial division. So we can try dividing by all these uh, zero up to n, these primes that we, we had in our set. Um, and because of the way p is constructed, you can see if you divide by p0, well, there's a factor of p0 here and a remainder of 1. If you divide by uh, p1, there's a factor of p1 here and a remainder of 1. So p is not, this new number p is not divisible by any of the other primes we started with. That doesn't still tell us whether it's prime or not, but what it does tell us, there's two cases. If p is not prime, it's a composite, it must be divisible by some other prime that wasn't on our list. Or it could be the case that p is actually a prime itself. Either way, what we find is either p is a new prime or there's some other prime that wasn't on our list. We found a prime that wasn't in the original list, that's the contradiction. So we started by assuming there were a finite number of primes, and we found ourselves some new prime that we didn't know about. So, you can check it. The steps are all foolproof. My explanation might not have been, but um, as we've found some contradiction here, the only conclusion we can possibly make is our theorem is false and infinitely many primes. So this is a, give us some hope when we go searching for them that we will find them. So I, I showed this uh, expression uh, n over log n as an approximation of the number of primes. This, uh, the blue line here, pi of n, is the prime counting function. You see it's slightly wiggly here, so it, it increases by one every time we find a prime. Um, but there, there, there are various approximations to this, and people can continually improve them. And actually, one of the, uh, the possibly sort of biggest questions in mathematics today, uh, at least in number theory, is the Riemann hypothesis. And it's a million dollar prize out for anyone who can solve this. And what the Riemann hypothesis will tell us really is a uh, uh, how to correct some of these approximations to get a very, very accurate uh, description of how this, this pi function I know, uh, behaves and where the primes are. Another illustration, actually, of this uh, seeming overall order but individual irregularity in primes is a, a figure you may have seen before called Ulam spiral. And this is done, so starting from the center here, you write all the integers starting from one and you spiral out uh, with larger and larger integers, and every time you come across a prime, you mark it with a dot. If it's not prime, it's prime. And so if you look at this, it kind of looks a bit uh, looks a bit weird. There's no kind of overall order. But what you can see here is there are some, um, there's clearly some, some, some strong diagonal lines appear along here, um, some down here. And this is just really showing that there is some order in among all this seemingly randomly distributed primes. Uh, and again, uh, it, gives, it gives us some uh, uh, some, some hope when we start investigating these, we might be able to find some order uh, in, in this sort of chaos of primes. 
So, you're really getting back to the, the, the headline topic for, for the talk, this uh, seven peter bust problem we're trying to solve. So where does this come from? This comes from a, 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 a mathematician called uh, Sierpinski, um, and probably the most famous thing that he did was develop this fractal here um, called Sierpinski's triangle. I don't know how many of you've seen that before. That's probably the thing that most people know. But he also made some, um, some big contributions to number theory. And so he was looking at a, uh, a particular kind of, of number uh, called prof numbers. And so these are, in some ways, are sort of similar to the Mersenne's view. It's 2 to the n, uh, in this case, plus 1 rather than minus 1, and also multiplied by some other integer. Okay. So this is, these are these prof numbers. Uh, actually, uh, because the mathematicians are uh, Number theorists tend to study special forms of prime numbers rather than just any large general integer because there are efficient ways of testing for them, um, like the Lucas Liver test for, for Mersenne primes, their equivalents for these prop numbers. Um, so, what we find actually there are many, many different pairs of k's and n's that we can choose to give primes, and we know millions of these different numbers. Um, but not all of them do. Um, some choices will not give, will give us composites. And one thing that Sierpinski proved in 1960, which is quite weird when you think about it, is that there are infinitely many choices of k you can make which will give no prime no matter what value of n you choose. And that's kind of surprising because you kind of think, well, okay, we pick a value of k and we just keep trying lots of different values of n and eventually it's reasonably likely that we will find a prime at some point. There are an infinite number of primes, so we have a reasonably good chance of finding one. But he showed actually there are some values of k, not just some, there are actually infinitely many, um, for which no matter what n you choose, uh, that you'll never get a prime. And these are what are called the Sapinski numbers. It's kind of counterintuitive. The first one he found was this 18-digit number. Um, it looks a bit obscure. Um, but it, this sort of sparked off uh, some interest in the, the number theory community. And within a few years, um, an American mathematician called Selfridge had found this uh, the five-digit number here, 78,557, which he showed um, was a Sierpinski number. And that today is actually is the smallest known uh, number which has this property. If you've set k equals 78,557, no matter what n you choose, you'll never get a prime. Okay? Now, how do you actually, I mean, how do you prove that? It's, it, it's quite a sort of surprising thing, really, because you, you, can't, you can't do it by an exhaustive proof in the sense of trying all the ends and showing that they're all composite, because there's an infinite number of possible ends. What he came up with is this thing called a covering set. It's a small set of numbers. But one of these numbers, will you can prove that it's a factor of one of these uh, k times 2 to the n plus 1 prof numbers, uh, irrespective of the value of n you choose. And the way this works is actually these, between them, all, any even n, so if n equals 0 mod 2, will have a factor which is 3. So that covers half of all the possible uh, n's you can choose. Even though there's an infinite number of n's, half of them will have a factor of 3. Another quarter of them will have a factor of 5. Another third of them will have a factor of 73. Eventually, you get to the last one, uh, module 36, and you find that 37 is a factor of 1 36th of all of these numbers. So actually, rather than having to, to cover, this is again another use of modular arithmetic, rather than having to cover an infinite range of possibly large n, we just need to cover all the cases up to 36. And because of the, the modular arithmetic we're working in, this extends sort of cyclically out to infinity. And you can therefore prove uh, that this number is in fact a Sierpinski number. <coughs> but what's the Sierpinski problem that we're trying to solve? This is a conjecture that was made by Sierpinski and Selfridge was that so they discovered a covering set for 78,557 and showed it was a Sierpinski number. The question remains, is it the smallest Sierpinski number? Because often when mathematicians are trying to tackle some problem, they want to kind of get a, a feel for one of the important points in the mathematical landscape, which ones have special values like these Sierpinski numbers. Um, you know, they want to know which is the smallest one. Okay? So that, that, that was the, the conjecture um, that, that was stated in 1962. Um, and since then, people are thinking, well, how would you prove that? So I'll, actually, I'll leave that as a question for you guys. How do you think you might go about proving um, that, that, that 78,557 is the smallest Sierpinski number? Any ideas? Test everything lower than that number. Test everything lower than that number. Good man. 
There you go. That's a, a, a pretty, reasonable, uh, pretty reasonable idea. You've only got uh, 78,536 Ks to test. You line them all up and uh, then start testing values of n and try and find primes. And if you find a prime, clearly it's not Sapinski numbers. This is not uh, exhaustive proof. But um, with apologies to JAWS, you know, I think they're going to need a bigger computer or a lot of pens and paper uh, to, to, to get that done. Um, and actually, I'm just, just, this is almost a, an, an aside in the talk, but I just wanted to show the influence that computers have had <coughs> doing this kind of uh, primality testing, uh, that, using exactly the same algorithms that you guys have been using in the worksheet. Um, but this, uh, the primer I showed you earlier, the, the 39 digit prime that Lucas uh, had, had proven by hand using Lucas sequences. Um, stood as a record actually for 75 years until uh, the middle of the 20th century um, when uh, people started writing programs for computers to do exactly these primality tests. Um, so they're using a very early uh, Miller and Wheeler. This is the sort of first record size prime number that was proved using a computer in 1951 um, using the, the, the EDSAC machine at Cambridge, which is here in the UK. This is an early uh, Valve-based computer. Uh, and they immediately managed to double the record size prime number that we did 75 years earlier by hand. Um, and then again, like when, uh, when, when Lucas sequences were first invented, there's a kind of gold rush of people trying to apply newer and greater computers to primality testing. And in the next year, going from, remember, from the, the, the 39 digits up to nearly 80 digits, Within another year, it extended out to nearly 700 digits, a large Mersenne prime uh, found by a, a, an American mathematician using, using a machine in the States. I just want to um, show you some pictures of these. I think it's always quite fun. I mean, this is my uh, hardware geek hat on here. So this is the, 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 the SWC, the uh, Standards Western Automatic Computer, which is in, uh, uh, in Berkeley, I think. Um, so this is a, 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 a Valve-based computer. Uh, so very bulky electronics kind of fills the room, and it seems to be built into an operator's desk here. Is it something that seems to go into computer design? They like to uh, build in furniture. Um, so then another record in, in 1963. So this is from the, the, the Illinois Automatic Computer. So this is based on uh, on transistors. So it's moving away from the valve technology onto transistors, uh, just starting to get a little bit more like what we understand to be a computer today. Um, and then a lot of records for large percent primes were held by Cray supercomputers. So this is the, the Cray 1. And so this is actually built using integrated circuit microprocessors like, like computers today. This, this whole machine here, to give you an idea of scale, this is like a bench that you can sit on around the outside. The reason it's circular is to, to allow all the wiring. There's about a mile of wiring in here, which is all done by hand. Um, and there's a single, a single processor inside this machine. This is a, a supercomputer from the the late 70s or early 80s. Uh, and there's a, a, a bunch of generations of these. The XMP, again, similar circular design with a nice bench and an 80s looking gentleman uh, sitting there uh, looking at a, a programmer's manual, I suspect. Um, another Cray machine uh, from the 90s. This actually has a, an external uh, cooling unit. They pump cooling fluid around to keep the electronics in here cold. Uh, and it gets radiated out here. There's a nice kind of waterfall of cooling fluid that comes out here to allow to radiate all the heat out. And then uh, up to 1996, uh, another Cray machine held the, the record with a prime number, which is around about, I think, 370,000 digits long. Uh, and actually, all these, uh, so it wasn't that Cray were particularly in the business of doing, uh, doing number theory on computers, but there was an engineer that worked for the Cray company called uh, David Slavinsky. And so what he would do, Cray would sell supercomputers uh, to, to, to centers around the world. In fact, I mean, we have crazy supercomputers now in Edinburgh. Um, they don't do this anymore, I think, but what David Slavinsky was doing was when the clients were not using their computers for whatever <coughs> application it was, or engineering or physical sciences or whatever it was, he was running the Mersenne prime testing program um, and the client was footing the electricity bill, but nobody ever told them off, it seems. I think they liked the, the publicity that they could claim that the, the largest primes had been run on their, uh, and found on their supercomputers. But in 1996, something very strange happened. The next record prime, which is just under half a million digits long, was found on an Intel Pentium-based uh, home computer. Um, 
And this is the only picture I can actually find it on the internet from a website called recycledgoods.com. So um, this is probably chucked with a stick nowadays. But uh, this is a real surprise from going from these enormous supercomputers, which are re reasonably rare, down to a commodity machine. And so what happens? I mean, the, the, these, uh, these supercomputers, we measure the performance, the number of operations, floating point operations per second they can do. Uh, this is like 7 billion operations per second for this. Uh, uh, the Cray supercomputer that proved finality of this number, compared to the, the Pentium processor, run 80 times slower. There's, there's clearly some, been some change in how things are done here. And what it was, was the, uh, this idea of distributed computing. Rather than just having one big powerful computer running a program, is that you can take advantage of lots and lots of uh, distributed low power computers that are contributed by volunteers. And so this project, um, called GIMPs, the Great Internet for Send Prime Search, was set up. And what happened is people would go onto the website there. I don't recommend you search for GIMPs in Google, by the way. Um, the website's mercend.org if you're looking for it. Um, and so they download a little program uh, called Prime95, which uh, was written in 1995, which implements very efficiently the Lucas Linger test in their hardware. And so Rather than running a whole range of possible candidate MRSN numbers on one big supercomputer, these would get distributed out amongst all the volunteers' uh, computers, and they, would co uh, they collected the results and, uh, and also kind of made sure progress was being made on the project. So this was really actually one of the first uh, volunteer computing projects. One of the ones you maybe more like have heard about is SETI at home, which is processing data from the RC radio telescope. Um, but they now have, you know, had thousands of users, up to hundreds of thousands, um, many bringing multiple CPUs. So they were really able to actually go streets ahead of what was able to be done with these uh, small number of crazy supercomputers. And since 1996, they've increased the world record size prime 12 times and constantly held this record. Uh, the most recent one being the one I showed you before with the 17 uh, million decimal digits that was discovered last year. Okay, so. Um, I kind of explained briefly what, what volunteer computing was about. I want to now go back to uh, the results of the, uh, the work that you've been doing in the intervening time and see how you all got on. So, um, so there was three different um, candidate primes I sent out. There was uh, M7, so that's 2 to the 7 minus 1. So who had that one? Uh, they all got a worksheet with that. But 1, 2, anyone else got? I think it's 31 is the number. Put two of them out there. Okay. Um, so what did you get to on the end of your, your worksheet? What was the final test? We were supposed one? to get to zero. Well, I'm just asking you, what did you get? No, I didn't. What did, okay, so you got, you got some value non-zero. What did you get? Several different answers. Several different answers, okay. And, and in the middle there? Zero. You got zero. Okay, well, you, you, you both, both, both get a sweetie for effort. We don't have a... <laughs> well, sorry, bad throw. Um, there was a third one around there somewhere, no? Yeah. Because one of the things you do in volunteer computing is you assume that the computers you send tasks to are untrustworthy and might give you the wrong answer. <laughs> uh, so typically what we do is actually we send out two copies of any task. Uh, if the answers agree, we assume they're right. If they disagree, we send out a third one uh, as a tiebreaker. So actually the, the correct answer should be zero, that, that uh, thir 31 is a prime. So uh, you check your arithmetic on that one. Um, Yep, okay, so uh, 2 to the 11 minus 1, who's got that one? One here. One here, not complete. Any complete ones? Complete on the back? What did you get? Non zero. Good man. Who else had 2 to the 11 minus 1? Only one person got to the end of it. Oh, I must be working you too hard here. Okay, so it's not prime. The answer you should have got, you should have got a. Uh, 1736, that's the, the, what we've been looking for there. And uh, last we've got 2 to the 13 minus 1. Did anyone get to the end of that one? Matt's still working on it. Okay, no sweets for you guys. You can, you can hand your homework in late. <laughs> uh, so that's another prime as well. So this just kind of illustrates um, actually also the fact that some computers are really slow. Um, and usually what we do is we send out a task with a deadline and say we want you to complete this within a month or something like that. And then if the task hasn't been completed, well, then we'll take it, the, the, the problem and hand it off to someone else in the hope we get an answer quicker. So you've probably illustrated the two main problems with volunteer computing, unreliable results and slow computers as well. 
Uh, so these are the kind of problems we have, we have to have to deal with. But let's get back to um, to the Sierpinski problem. So what we said was we're going to try and find primes, uh, prop primes with k's for all the values less than seventy-eight thousand five hundred thirty-seven. Um, so that's our method. We start with small n's because small n's is all the small numbers um, which are much cheaper to test. And actually, you very quickly find a lot of primes. About two thirds of all the possible k have a very very small prime less than less than nine. Um, and so th this was really uh, following on from the conjecture which was stated in the 60s. Um, many of these k's in, in, in our search here were eliminated uh, by finding off primes. And by the mid-80s, there was only 70 values of k um, which remained with no known primes. And n's have been tested all the way up to 8,000. So even for n to the 8,000, is quite a large number, actually. And you really need uh, powerful computers, as I said, or volunteer computing projects. So this is just a graph showing how the uh, the number of k's that, that, that remain in the search has decreased um, from around about uh, tens of thousands down to today, um, and also how the, the increase in n that you've had to get to to find primes has eliminated those k's. So as n increases, it gets harder and harder to be testing more and more expensive, um, but we continually have less and less k's to test as we limit it. Once we find one prime, that's enough to say that something's not a Sierpinski number. So where does 17 or bust come in? So this is, as I said, was done using some supercomputers and also you know, computers in, in individual researchers at uh, the uh, university. So in, uh, I think, 2002, there were 17 Ks remaining. And so there was a volunteer computing project set up called 17 or BUST. They said, we're going to test these 17 numbers, find a prime, that's the 17 part, or we go BUST. Of course, if the conjecture is wrong, and one of those remaining k's is in fact a smaller Sierpinski number, by definition we'd never find a prime for that k. So this is a kind of, you could argue, I mean, a mathematical conjecture is not just somebody's random thought, that, oh, I'll conjecture this. There's, there's a certain amount of belief that this is likely to be true, the reason being because for none of these smaller k's has it been possible to find a covering set of factors like the one I showed you before. So there's a certain amount of um, uh, belief that this is true, and also as you start to eliminate these k, you can start to plot out some statistics about the rate at which you you uh, you remove k from the search. Um, and so we're not quite at the point yet where we're really starting to get seriously worried um, that the conjecture is not true. But right now there are about there are in fact six k's left for which there's no known prime for that k. So that's so we've got, now very quickly actually from 17 as soon as this project was set up, we very quickly eliminated. Uh, about another uh, uh, eight or nine of these k, and there's been some steady progress over the last few years. It's kind of flattened out, but of course, actually, you can, the the value of n being tested is still going up as we're continually searching for more and more of these primes. Uh, and so, the the 17 or bust project has now kind of merged uh, with prime grid. So, prime grid, alongside GIMPs, are the two real big uh, distributed volunteer computing projects uh, searching for primes. Prime has been around for about 10 years now, and it was originally set up um, by this chap called uh, Rita Slatkovicius, is Lithuanian. Um, but now there's actually a team of people, quite a large team of people working on the project, including myself. Um, and so now actually we work on a whole range of, of primality testing projects, um, not just uh, 17 or BOST, but a whole bunch of other things as well, which I'll show you about. And uh, it's probably the largest uh, project on this. Uh, uh, the, this setup called BOIC, which just supports a whole bunch of different volunteer community projects. There are about 50,000 uh, users or so. There's another hundred of you in, in the room, so I hope when I leave I can just knock that up to uh, 50,100. So, so what Prime Grid doing? Um, so two things. One, we're solving conjecture problems. Like 17 or BUST, there are also a, a, a sort of family of four or five related conjectures for different kinds of numbers apart from the prof numbers. Um, and also we're searching for world record size primes. Um, so some of the, actually, the prime numbers that, um, if, if we find a prime for some of the k's that currently remain in the Sierpinski project, you get, <laughs> you get prime numbers of maybe uh, four or five million digits. These are quite big numbers. Not, the, not absolute world records in themselves, but certainly up there. But we also have some other projects looking for world record primes. Um, you can connect more or less any kind of computer you can imagine to prime grid. Um, if you have an Android phone, you can even use your phone for testing prime numbers. I'm not sure what it'll do to your battery life. Um, and, and so there's a whole bunch of things we have on, on the project. We have challenges which get people introduced 
to particular projects so they can learn about what's going on in those, what's the maths behind them, and have to go running tests on their computer. You can join a team of like-minded people from, from the UK or from other countries or from particular organizations. And there's a really good, you know, I said we have you know, tens of thousands of users, there's a really good community of people there. Some of whom come along, they don't know the maths at all, and they learn the maths as they go along. Some of them are really into optimizing their computers to test these numbers really, really quickly. And it's actually a really helpful uh, and welcoming community for, for people joining. Um, I'll just listen on this slide some of the, um, some of the records that, that, that Prime Grid has. So, I mean, GIMPs just searches for Mersenne Primes, and they hold the really top end records for the largest primes known. They're all Mersenne Primes. There's all these other special forms of numbers, um, like the Cullen Primes here, which is some. This is actually a Cullen Prime is a subset of prof primes. It's where the k value here is equal to the n value, and those have some special properties. And so we have a bunch of these uh, sort of sub projects running on the prime grid. Uh, and the generalized Fermat primes, so these are the ones which we're currently, if we find a new prime in our generalized Fermat search, that would become the new, uh, the new world number one prime eclipsing all these um, Mersenne primes and GIMPs. So if you want to uh, get your name in the record books and get an interview on the BBC, come along and uh, join the, the generalized Fermat prime search. So um, if you want to do this, um, it's all done on the web. Uh, just go to primegrid.com, dead easy, there's a download link, you download a little program onto your computer and you connect up to us and you get a little, uh, a little app like this that runs on your, on your computer or on your phone and tells you what your computer is doing, how far through the test it is and, uh, and, and you, you can watch the progress and hopefully at some point you'll find some primes. Um, some things I, I would just uh, put a note of caution on this, um, if you run Primal tests on your computer, your computer may get hot, um, especially if you're using a laptop or something like that. Um, so uh, just be a bit careful, you know, and don't wear shorts and sit on your knee. Um, and also, this, this is something that, that we say, you know, don't only run Prime Grid on computers that you own, um, especially it's good for, you know, uh, you, you, don't, you don't want your employer footing the electricity bill for you running your computer 24 seven and then firing you, um, or if you're at school, running on school computers. Uh, so some of the, the, these large primality tests can take a really long time. Um, so the, the world record tests um, actually you know, can take weeks to complete. They're quite long calculations. But also some of the other uh, types of primes I showed in that slide before, um, you can do the test in a few hours. And so there's a range of things. And depending on how modern your computer is, you might want to uh, experiment first with some of the, the, the shorter tests. Uh, but as I said, there's lots of support uh, on, on, the, on the forums uh, for uh, for, for people coming to project. I actually want to just speak about the length of tests. Um, so I set going uh, when I hand out your, your worksheets. So this was um, uh, a primality test. This is actually for a Mersenne number. Um, so this was the 420,000 uh, 420, digit Mersenne number, which was the first Mersenne prime found by the Gibbs project in 1996. Um, and it took somewhere just under 10 minutes um, on, on my laptop. So uh, that kind of goes to show actually just in the space of uh, just under 20 years what was then a world record, you can just do like that on, 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 on current hardware. And, that, and that's why the, uh, the, the records have been continually pushed. This is doing exactly the same thing as you were doing in your worksheet, this Lucas Lamer loop. It's just rather than, I think for, the, uh, for M17, there's 15 steps in the algorithm, here there's uh, 1.3 million steps to get through, so it would take a little while to work through on pen and paper. Okay, okay so um, that's really all, all I want to share with you today. Um, what I would say uh, as a kind of take-home message, if you're interested in setting records, all of the, uh, the record prime numbers from the last 17 years have come from volunteer computing. And volunteer computing, I mean, it's about the projects, it's about games, it's about Prime Grid, but really it's about you guys that contribute your computing time. And without people to actually uh, you know, to, to sign up on the project and contribute CPU time, we could do nothing. Um, so the next record order could be one of you. Um, so with that, I just want to finish by thanking, um, these are some of the people that have been involved um, with Prime Grid and also with the 17 of Us project. 
um, and also to acknowledge uh, Rackspace, who provide all the hardware um, that, that we run our, our website on. So, uh, thank you very much. I hope you found that interesting. Um, I hope I maybe inspired some of you to come along and, and try out volunteer computing. Um, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them now. We have some time left um, before the, the, the next event in the program. Or again, you can go to, to the Prime Room website and, and find out more there. So, thanks very much.